And tonight we are talking about this new series called Free People. And it's based out of Galatians. And the thing is, when you think about free people, what comes to mind? What comes to mind? Being free, what, does, what comes to mind? You're not in jail. That's the first one. Prison. What else? Joyous? That's good. You actually are getting ahead of me, but that's a good, good one. You're not in school. Who all thinks freedom is summer break? It's like last day of school. It's like, freedom! Uh, but so who else? What? America. <laughs> okay, Chloe. Open. No boundaries. That's a good one, too. Kindle, back in the back. We have a Kindle. What would you say? Driving. Man, when I get to be 16, I get to drive. I have freedom. The thing is, in all these scenarios, there's one thing in common. Freedom. As a teenager, you've got more freedom than you've ever had in your whole entire life. But you still hunger for more. Can I be honest? As a 36-year-old, I still hunger for more freedom. Because that's part of the human condition. We all want more freedom. But where do we find that? Because freedom basically is the opposite of having something or someone control you. We don't like being controlled, do we? Here's a little caveat for you. You will always be controlled by something. And if you really boil it down, you'll be controlled by things of this world, and you're part of this world, so that you could be you, controlling you, which is uh, called secular humanism. It's all about you. Me is the center of everything, which scripturally is wrong. It needs to be Jesus. It could be boyfriend, girlfriend. It could be school. It could be sports. It could be money. It could be addictions. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be sex. It could be any of those things. That's one side. We're just going to put that over here in things of this world. Or you're controlled by Jesus and the Holy Spirit that is in your life. You get to choose which one you're going to walk in. And the thing here is, the world will promise you freedom, but it's actually chains of bondage. It will wrap you up and tie you up because it doesn't care about you. It wants to suck you dry and use you up. Freedom comes from Jesus. And sometimes we think, oh man, Jesus, man, he takes away all these freedoms. Do you know everything that Jesus asks us to do is for our benefit? Think about when you're younger. None of you guys are this young, but my son is seven. He does not like eating his vegetables. So as a great parent that I want him to experience freedom, what am I going to do? Aiden, you never, ever have to eat vegetables because I want you to like me. I am giving him complete freedom in eating his vegetables, and he's not going to eat them, but man, he's going to love me, right? In that moment, guys, listen. In that moment, yes, he's going to love me more than if I told him to eat his vegetables. He thinks. Might even experience it a little bit. But here's the problem. Everything I'm doing is for him to like me and love me more. That's what the world does. Everything they tell you about freedom is always directed back to what they get. Think about it. Come to this concert and you'll experience this because you're going to like it so much because we're there. Buy this product because, guess what? When you buy a product, who gets the money? You? No, the people creating the product. But a good parent says, no, you're going to eat your vegetables. Why? Because I see beyond where you're seeing right now that you hate broccoli. Because I know broccoli is going to help you grow up strong and healthy. Because when you're 30 and 40 or even in your teens, guess what? Those are some habits that you need to have so you are a healthy individual. With Jesus, it's the same thing. Well, why should I have to go and worship? You know what? You might not get it right now, but someday you will, and it's for your health. It's for your spiritual health. Why do I have to read the Bible? It's so boring. Because verses I memorized when I was five still are in my heart today that the Holy Spirit brings up. Why do I have to hang out with other Christians? Can't I just do what I want? Guess what? One bad apple ruins the whole batch. 
you'll pick up the habits with those you hang out with. I'm a Duke basketball fan. Duke basketball, Blue Devils. You want to know why I'm a Duke fan? John Wheeler was my best friend in sixth grade, and he loved Duke. I didn't even know what basketball really was, but he was my best friend, so I want to be like John. So guess what? I'm going to like Duke too. To this day, I love Duke basketball just because John Wheeler said Duke's the best team. How many of your friends have that type of influence on you? Oh, I'm strong enough. No, you're not. We're all human. We all can be influenced. So be careful who you hang out with because it's going to hurt your freedom. So it's about your health. So this is why some people have a hard time with the idea of God or church in the Bible. They think Christianity is all about rules. The thou shalt nots. Just think about a few of those. Thou shalt not drink any alcohol. Thou shalt not have sex before marriage. Thou shalt not cheat on any school assignment. Thou shalt not cur- use curse words unless you only say them in, with the first letter or whisper them. We try to find little loopholes. Guess what? You can say foot, but think something else in your heart. You know what God judges you on? The thought of your heart. You're just mean. No, that's what the Bible says. Thou shalt not. Then the thou shalt. Thou shalt pray and read your Bible. Go to church. We talked about that. Uh, talked about that. Thou shalt talk to God. Spend time in your small group. All those things. Because rules feel like control, don't they? But speaking of rules, have you ever been to Disney World? Who's been to Disney World or Disneyland before? Or Silver Dollar City? Guess where, what's at these places that we love? Rules. Because if we did not have those rules in place, it would be something called anarchy. And that means whoever is biggest, baddest, meanest gets their way. So say you're at a roller coaster. Who all likes roller coasters? So you're at the roller coaster, and there are no rules. You don't have to buckle in. You can get in at any size. You don't have to worry about what speed it is. And you know what? You don't have to wait in line. Whoever gets in, gets in. We, we, don't, we hate rules, right? We hate rules, so we don't want any rules at that roller coaster. Are you going to get on that roller coaster? Who wants to sign up for that? No, you don't. No, you don't. Because it's chaos. Because you probably saw someone fly out of the cart and die because there was no rules involved. Rules are part of life. Now, rules, what changes a rule from being something for you or against you is part of why that rule was put in place. Think about a fence. Disney World has a fence around it. Silver Dollar City has a fence around it. The heart behind a fence, in that sense, is to protect. I have a fence in my backyard. It's to protect my yard. That's the heart, is protection. The rules of the Bible are there for your protection, so you can truly live free within that protected zone. But we tend to think rules are more like fences and prisons to confine us. Here's the problem. We try to define the fence without trying to look to who set up the fence, which is, which is God. We need to know God the Father and his heart for us. Because if we know he is for us and not against us, that he loves us with everlasting love, that he calls you beautiful and worthy, not because of what you've done, but because of who I am. And I made you, I created you, Psalm 139, go read that. And guess what? I might think, man, if he's asked me to do something, it might be to protect me and not to hurt me. Ever think about it that way? Ever think about it that way? So this whole series is based out of Galatians. And Galatians were written by Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament. 
uh, the Apostle Paul uh, set up a lot of churches, and he'd set up a church and go to another area and set up another church, and he'd write these letters back and forth with people, talking to them, helping bring correction and understanding to situations they were going through. So how do we know this? this is Galatians 1, 1 through 2. Paul, an apostle, not from men or through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the church of Galatia. Why do we talk about that? Is because we want to know what Paul, who wrote it, because Paul had this mentality. Because he understood law and rules. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Some scholars believe that he was actually next in line to be the next, like in line to be a high priest. Like he was like doctor level. He was on, in line to do something great with religion. He got all the rules. So that's why it's important as we're talking about being free people. Paul understood about the rules, but he also understood about Jesus and bringing grace. And he helps us understand how to navigate this. So the Galatians were dealing with a lot of tension. Tension between following the rules and giving people grace and forgiveness when they didn't follow the rules. Have you ever been the person who's trying to follow the rules and everyone else is breaking them? It gets kind of annoying, right? So where, where's that tension like, okay, I forgive that person for breaking the rules when we're playing this board game. Okay, it's fine. And when is it like, no, we're stopping the game. We're not playing anymore. Done. You are kicked off the island. You are voted off. Where's that line? There's that tension. So the people were confused. The law or grace? Which one should we do? And in Galatians, one of the things that they were having issues with in the church of Galatia is this idea of circumcision. And some people are like, circumcision, oh my word, you're talking about teens about that. It's in the Bible, so we can have some discussion about it. Circumcision is a mark upon a male child that we find about in the Old Testament with Abraham is where it began, and it was a sign of covenant. It was a sign saying that this is a man for God. Okay? Old Testament was very physical and application. In Hebrews, you hear about types and shadows of the Old Testament, but now we're in the New Testament, all right? So this was one of those things that people could say, okay, cool, you are of the people of God. Okay, this is how males were marked. So we come into the New Testament, and people are saying again, well, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to have the same mark. And they're saying, uh, older men, you need to have this mark. And older men are saying, hey, what? And if you're like, okay, what exactly is circumcision? Talk to your parents tonight. But the point is, it's a mark upon a male. So, okay, so you're like, okay, let's make this a little less awkward. So let's think about it this way. Say, in the Old Testament, if you were going to be a part of God's family, you had to get a tattoo right here on your face. That's your mark of covenant. So you walk around with a tattoo on your face right here saying, I love Jesus or something. All right? So we come into the New Testament, and they're saying, okay, to be a part of the covenantal people, you have to, again, have this mark on your face. All right? And people are going like, okay, I don't want to get this mark on my face because I heard about this Jesus, and it's not about this whole outward stuff. It's about my heart being transformed, and then from the transformation of my heart, I'm going to be changed. And, man, I, I can't follow all these rules. But, man, if I get this mark, then I'm good to go. Because, guys, these, these people are dealing with the same thing you do as students. Same thing we do as Christians in America. We look for a check mark to make us okay. We look for doing something and says, hey, I went to church last Sunday, so I'm okay with God. I read my Bible for the last four days, so that makes me okay. That's not okay to think that way. You're okay, therefore you read your Bible. I'm okay with Jesus, so I want to go to church. I don't go to church to make myself okay with Jesus. Get the difference? You're going like, what? Th this is crazy. No, we look for a check mark. We look for something, some sign to say, I'm good. And that's what they're saying here. It's like, okay, cool. What, where's your tattoo? Where's your face tattoo? Where's your circumcision to prove that you're a Christian? To full, prove that you're following Jesus. Some of us think the same thing. It's like, man, show me your Instagram stories. Well, see, you're not a Christian. I, you haven't posted a verse for three days. On your Facebook page. You didn't share that thing about if you don't share this, you're going to be cursed. But if you share it, you're going to be blessed on Facebook. So therefore, you're not a good Christian. Come on, guys. We do the same thing. 
is not about the outward first, then going to the inward. It's from the inside out. Ever hear that song? It's from the inside out. That's how we're transformed from the inside out, not the outside in. Jesus talked about it. It's not what goes into the man who defiles him. It's what comes out of him. It's the same thing. It's not what you put into the body that makes you holy. It's what comes out of the body. It's what comes out of your heart that makes you produce fruit of righteousness or fruit of the flesh, which is sinful. So it goes back to what I started with. What's your expectation? Where's your heart at with Jesus? Because guess what? You can do all the right things outwardly and still be far away from Jesus. In Matthew 15, 7 through 9, this is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. Man, they're good churchgoers, right? They're great worshipers. They raise their hands when they're supposed to raise their hands. They pray great prayers. But then Jesus goes on. But their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me. It's all about your heart. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Sometimes we get so hung up on you doing the right things, we lose sight of the heart. And that's where true freedom comes from. Some people felt they had to take the step to be okay with God. But Paul comes in and says in Galatians 5, 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not... Submit again to the yoke of slavery. If you've been set free from the law of sin, death, hell, and the grave, don't yoke yourself back again to slavery, to religion. Think about it this way. If you throw off the chains that are dirty and gunked up and just nasty, rusty, you were bound up with them and Jesus sets you free from that, don't go over here and just because it's a brand new chain that looks gold, don't wrap yourself up in it. Because guess what? Are you still in bondage? You're still in bondage at that point. I couldn't find chains to do the illustration, but I think we can imagine that. So the Galatians believed that real God followers did certain things, such as circumcision. What's interesting is Jesus got in trouble for not following the law himself. He didn't wash his hands correctly one time. and they, Sorry, his disciples and him didn't wash his hands correctly. And the Pharisees, oh, you're breaking the law on the Sabbath. He did something, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus is like, what? You don't get it, guys. You're so focused on this outward action. You're losing sight of the heart. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. That's where freedom comes from. But Paul was saying that it was now all about Jesus and what he did. And no longer about how well we followed the control of rules and those laws. Romans 8 one through two, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Remember, you're controlled by one, the flesh or the spirit. You choose which one. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Again, there's the law of the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the law of the spirit that produces fruit of the spirit, all the great things where freedom is, and then there's a lot of the flesh which really is bondage. So Paul didn't say, is for church attendance you have been set free. It's for good behavior that you have been set free. It's for perfection that you've been set free. It's for losing your individuality that you have been set free. It's for boredom you have been set free. When it comes to a close relationship that is based in grace, you and I are set free to relax. Here's the thing. When we've been set free, we want to engage with the one who set us free more. So when we've been set free by Jesus, we probably want to spend more time with Jesus. But some of us sometimes think, man, I want freedom in Jesus, but I also want to live like the world. Guess what? That's a dangerous place to be. Because, again, you're doing all the good lip service over here. Lip service meaning doing all the right things. But where's your heart? You might be doing everything correct over here. But if your heart's not with Jesus, you really are. If Jesus looks at you, you are with the world. I'm just being honest with you guys. I did all the right things in high school, but my heart was over here. And God rebuked me heavily when I was 18 over that. Jesus wants us to be free people. That's his desire. 
John 8, 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So if Jesus made you free, you're free. You can declare that. This comes down to your view of walking with God. Some of you have spent your whole life thinking like this. Being close to God equals following the rules. Being close to God equals, we say it all the time, abiding with Jesus. And from abiding, guess what you'll do? You'll produce fruits of righteousness and you will start doing the correct things. But it's not about you doing the right things to make sure you're okay with God. Not following the rules equals not being close to God. You know the distance when you're not walking with Jesus? When you've done something sinful or hurtful? So say, uh, I'm walking away from Jesus. You know how far it is to turn back to him and embrace him? So I'm walking away from him. You know how, how close, do I have to walk clear all the way over there? I turn around, he's right here waiting for me. He's right here. The thing is, some of us in this room, I think, man, I am so far from Jesus, there's no hope for me. There's hope. You just need to turn. You just need to turn. And he's right there waiting with open arms. You don't even have to clean yourself up. You don't have to get perfect enough for him. You don't have to do the right things. You don't have to read uh, all of John uh, 3.16. You don't have to memorize things. You don't have to journal. You just have to turn around and say, Jesus, I need you. Help me. He is just a turn away. He is just a turn away. It feels like your relationship with God is always on the line when you mess up. I grew up that way. So I always felt like I wasn't close to him. I never caught that I just needed to turn when I did something wrong. And he was right there with me. But remember, it's for freedom you have been set free. That means you are free when you have messed up. You're free to pray when you fail. You're free to participate in worship even when you feel like you don't deserve it. I think that's maybe some of us in this room when it comes to worship is that we feel like we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to be loved or cared about. It's not about you deserving it. It's about that God calls you deserved. Before you even could do anything, he says you deserve it. Why? Because Jesus came, died on the cross, and rose three days later. That you can have a life with him and live free. You're free to be close to God even when you're not being good. You're free to call yourself a Jesus follower even when you haven't acted like a Jesus follower should. That's a big one. But like I said, you do need to say, you know what, I'm a Jesus follower. I need to turn because I want that relationship with him. We can relax in our relationship with God. Remember, because of Jesus, we are free to live under grace. Romans 6, 14, 4, sin shall not have dominion or control over you. Sin should not control you if you're a Christian. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Jesus did not everything that needs to be done for us to be good with God. Romans 3, 21 through 24. This is a little bit longer section of scripture, but it kind of proves this point from Old Testament to New Testament. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Pause there. The law and the prophets were pointing towards something. Jesus, the need of a Savior to come. That's what the law was about, is pointing to that there was this need for this perfect sacrifice to occur. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one can be perfect enough. No one can follow the law good enough in the Old Testament to be okay with God. That's why I had to kill animals. That's why the Old Testament is important, guys. Is it points to Jesus. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified freely means it's a free gift. You've been justified. What does justified mean? So you guys are like, oh, what well, justified? That's a big word. It means just if I had never sinned. That's what Jesus' blood does, is bring you into that relationship. 
and that's free. You don't have to do anything to earn it. But say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. Turn to him. The law was there to point to us needing a Savior. That's why we need Jesus. Ow. My finger hurts now. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our decisions do matter. Our choices do matter. We talked about that. But for now, if you're a follower of Jesus, relax. There's nothing you need to do to prove that you're a good Christian. Abide with him. Spend time with him. Talk to him. Like, you, oh, I thought you told me you didn't need to do it. No, you don't need to do physical activity. You don't need to get that tattoo on your face. But guess what? It's about relationship and not religion. So to have a relationship, you need to do something called communication with Jesus. So hopefully this has sparked some stuff in your heart and your mind tonight about what it means to be a free person. And some people say, man, that was kind of deep. Yeah, it was, because I want you to truly walk free. Because there are some people in our world that teach that, man, it's okay. Just say this little prayer, and you're good to go. Just live however you want. Guess what? At the end of the day, you're really not free at that point. The way of freedom is abiding in Christ. Every day, spending time with him. And he's the one who's going to help you walk out your journey because it's individual to you. You're uniquely made. My journey and Jim's journey are completely different because we're different people. But guess what? There's one commonality I can say to every single person who knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You need to abide. Jim abides, I abide. But guess what? They can look different. But we're still abiding, right, Jim? That's what it means to live free. So let me pray for you, then you'll head up to your small groups. Father God, we thank you so much for tonight, Lord. Help us to understand what it means to be free people. Not just in theory, but in true application of when we say, God, I'm free, I'm going to abide in you. Lord, help us engage with you in a deeper way through worship, through your word, through living in this world to be light for you, be salt for you. Help us to remember that True freedom is not the absence of control. True freedom is being in control, being, con- being controlled by you and not the world. That's true freedom. Help us to understand that. Help us to understand that even though that we're young, we can still be world changers and history makers. That we can make a difference in our schools, in our homes, in our families. That we need to no longer make excuses when it comes down to following you. But start looking at what it means to be all in with you today. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.